Obrigada. Bom, vamos abrir, então, esse último painel do dia. Alguém gostaria de começar fazendo perguntas? Uma pergunta? Ah, por favor, eu tenho ali um participante. É, vamos esperar chegar o microfone. Tem outra pergunta? Ali, ó, por favor. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, how would you explain the decline of classical liberalism throughout the 20th century? How would I explain the decline of classical liberalism throughout the 20th century? Well, again, uh, we have to uh, recognize that class the classical liberals had very powerful enemies. Right? Uh, and Uh, at for, and so who were the governments at the time? Primarily we had uh, monarchical governments uh, who were small by, by present day standards, right? So I mean, even something, somebody like uh, Louis XIV, he controlled a very tiny part actually of, uh, of the GDP of France at the time, maybe 10 or 15%, which was next to nothing, right? So, but still, so they resented the, the loss of power that was inflicted of, uh, on them by the, the rise of the classical liberal movement. So what they did was, in a way, very similar to what um, uh, the uh, various parts of the, the U.S. administration have been do, uh, doing in the past 20 years, ever since the Soviet empire collapsed. Right? So uh, the biggest part of American government spending or federal spending concerned the military. So that was no longer necessary. So they could have uh, reduced spending, right? reduced uh, the apparatus, and so on. They did the exact opposite by looking for new missions. And they did the same thing too. Right? So the, uh, the, uh, the British uh, uh, ruling class in the middle of the 19th century, when it was clear that the, the liberals were gaining the upper hand in, inside of the country, were then exporting their activities to other countries, start, starting the colonization movement, reinforcing the colonization movement, in order to uh, create jobs and revenues for the science of Uh, noble families. That's what they did. And then, of course, right, you have another wave of uh, interventionism, right, because this creates, of course, hostile relationships uh, abroad, so there, is, uh, there are conflicts abroad, there's a greater necessity, so, called, uh, so to say, to, to send more troops in, right, you get an endless uh, uh, sequence of, uh, of government, uh, further government interventions. Uh, so what they did was then, uh, it was a, in a way, it was a very creative backlash. They inf invented new reasons to intervene and created new problems that the classical liberals had not yet addressed right? and forged new alliances. The most famous case was the one of Bismarck, so the representative of the old aristocratic ru ruling classes in Germany, who forged an alliance with the labor movement against the liberals. On the day when the, uh, the, com the German Allied forces had conquered Paris, there was a German-French war in 1870-1871. On the day when the French had surrendered, Mises, uh, not Mises, uh, Bismarck, right? Bismarck said, not, oh, how happy are we that finally the, the frogs have surrendered or something like this. He didn't say this. He said, now the German liberals are done. Now the German liberals are done. Okay. So it was a relentless war with new techniques and so on, fought very creatively, and to which the, the classical liberals, or the, the liberals at the time, uh, did not react with sufficient vigor at the beginning. And there was temptation that some of them were co-opted into the government, so they, they got revenues and nice positions and so on. So I hope that all of you guys will stay very rich so that you cannot be tempted by government. right? <laughs> But this, of course, it's, that's what governments typically do. They try to co-opt, corrupt the, the opposition. That's what they do in all African countries. They have ample resources to do so. Right? So uh, the libertarians, modern-day libertarians, need to be creative and inventive too. Right? But we have, of course, a much more powerful intellectual arsenal today than we had in those days. Right? Of course, also much more intelligence of the mechanisms of power and so on. But still, it's, it's a very hard battle. 
And I don't say it's, it's won from the outset, but I'm very optimistic that we will win. É, foi enviada uma outra pergunta, eu vou tentar traduzir. Do you believe that the Austrian school is the closest uh, school to the Catholic ethic tradition? Yes, yeah, I'm, I myself, I'm, uh, I'm a Catholic, and uh, it's not just my, my personal fancy, but again, I see that this traces back many centuries into the past. Right? The, the first uh, intellectuals who had gained an understanding of how market works and that markets are by and large Uh, spontaneous uh, uh, formations were Catholic intellectuals, and they combined this with uh, uh, Catholic theology. And I th still think that that's the case today. Now, as far as Austrian uh, Austro-libertarianism is concerned, as a political movement, of course, you don't have to be a Catholic in order to subscribe. Of course, as a Catholic, I'm particularly convinced that uh, there's uh, mutual reinforcement in several respects here. But even let's say if you're an atheist, uh, you you might come to the same political conclusion. Right? Mais alguma pergunta da, da audiência? Just a, a ah, é, vamos esperar só chegar o microfone, por favor, porque nós estamos transmitindo. Ok. What uh, you would say if they tried to intervene in the economic system, in the market, with uh, some uh, uh, Catholic rules, let's say. What uh, would be your opinion about that? Yeah, I think that this would uh, be a violation of uh, what, what the church should stand for, right? The, the church, as, as you know, right, uh, uh, has for many centuries been crystal clear about the uh, question whether there should be forced conversions, for example. Right? Uh, so, uh, from the 16th century, the Pope has stressed this, there should be no forced conversion, there, we have to respect the natural liberty of each individual person, and so on. So, but if we are against forced conversions, then how can we force upon the population any other aspect right, of, uh, of Catholic doctrine? So, this, this is uh, contradictory, I think, and it would be destructive of religion, of organized religion. We see this in several countries in Europe, for example, in Germany, all bishops are paid by the state. All bishops are paid by the government out of uh, uh, church taxes collected by the federal government. France, uh, it's similar. All right, the government pays for all churches and so on, for, for the maintenance. Now, I mean, if you consider this, this of course creates a very perverse incentive system because then the, uh, the clergy comes to identify with very secular concerns of, of, of the state and of the, of the government out of material self-interest just to keep the church activities going. This is destructive of the church. Therefore, church attendance is at an all-time low in, in Germany and also in France. We will get out of this only if there's a radical separation of the, the church from the state, right? You need everything that the state touches is a deadly grip, right? It's a kiss of death, right? So whatever you love, whether it's your language of your poetry or songs and so on, be sure there's no government intervention there. Uh, after 30 years, it's dead, you can be sure. <laughs> so on behalf of Mrs. Brazil, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. Thank, thank you so you. much.